Oh, hello. Okay. Hi, Alison. Hi, Law Centre. Apologies, she's teaching now. Oh, yeah. okay. We're just about to start. So, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, a quick note that we are recording and that the recording will be published as part of New South Wales History Week. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, wherever you may be located, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and in particular to the Pamelong clan of the Wabagal people of the land in which the Callaghan campus resides and where we in the room are located today. Uh, I should also express my regret at the passing of Queen Elizabeth II and to note that we're holding the seminar on the first day of the reign of King Charles III. Um, the heartfelt thanks also to Gabby Edelstein and the Early Modern Studies Seminar here at UON for co-hosting our paper today, and I hope this will be the first of many such uh, collaborative events. Our speaker, uh, Garrett Van Dyck, is lecturer at the University of Newcastle. He has published essays in uh, A Cultural History of Plants in the 17th and 18th centuries, Image, 18th century life, and I'm going to horribly mispronounce this, uh, Petit Propos uh, Culinaire. He is a recipient of the Sophie Coe Prize for writing in food history. And today he'll be discussing his new monograph, Commerce, Food and Identity in 17th Century England and France Across the Channel, published by Amsterdam University Press in 2022. Over to you, Chip. Thank you, Sinch. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, thank you for your acknowledgement of the country. Um, I, I add my own and uh, extend this to their ancestors, descendants, and to country itself. Um, it's a good day, I think, um, being sort of a dreary, rainy Friday uh, to, uh, to get together and have a seminar. Um, and after the passing of Her Majesty, um, an interesting day to also um, consider uh, the sort of icons of national identity, uh, how they're represented and how they came to be. Um, so uh, today's uh, presentation, we'll look at my new book. Um, and talk about um, the major themes that I address in my work. So I look at how eating and drinking, the preferences, especially amongst elite consumers um, in the 17th century, came to be associated with um, what it meant to be French or English. Um, the period that the book covers begins in 1651, and this date isn't random, but it's the first publication of a self-proclaimed French cookbook, Le Cuisine de François, um, and it goes to 1717. Again, the date has not been just picked at random, but this is when the East India Company's monopoly on tea from Canton goes into effect. It's also the crossover point at which imports of tea eclipse imports of coffee. So in this period, um, ideas of what it meant to eat like an Englishman and a Frenchman grew out of myths um, that established foundations um, for food choices. And these myths are now perceived as both being nationally and culturally determined. And these choices in turn resulted in distinctive food ways that were linked to collective identity and shared cultural virtues that have endured when you're with us today. So here we've got um, two, um, two major uh, speakers. Um, we've got Roland Barthes and we've got uh, Jonathan Béas Savarin. And they both have things to say about food and identity. And the one from Bria Savaran, most people have heard, and he said um, in a maxim from the 19th century, uh, physiology of taste, he said, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you who you are. Dis-moi ce que tu manges, et je te dirai qui tu es. And it's seductive, but it's also overused. And it probably obscures as much as it actually tells us when we start to think about how these food choices come about um, and how they're linked to collective identity, and they don't really discuss, it doesn't really discuss the idea of contingency, which I'll, I'll speak about in a little bit. Um, we have a slightly more useful framework from uh, French literary theorist and semiotician, Van Bart, and he's got a more nuanced and complicated framework of food as a system of communication with history. He said that food permits a person to partake each day of the national past, um, uh, representing a whole experience of the accumulated wisdom of our ancestors. And he was speaking specifically about uh, French cuisine there, um, but I think it holds true for many different cultures. For Bart, food was not only a cultural signifier of a shared cultural past, but a contemporary marker of national identity. Sometimes um, I've, I've had people ask me, they say, well, food and identity I understand, but for commerce, how does commerce 
fit in. It doesn't seem like a natural fit into the equation. Um, and the picture there is of a, uh, not the original, but a later crest for the East India Company. Obviously it's later because we've got the Union flag um, not appearing until 1707. In the 17th century, these cultural myths of national identification began to develop around uh, specific types of food and drink in England and France. And they reflected the emergence of collective self-identification. And I've used national there in quotes just because we don't really have a nation as a, uh, as a real political entity in the 17th century. It's not really there yet. Um, and most people, uh, most historians who work on nation um, tend to argue that that doesn't really appear until, let's say, 1789 with the French Revolution. So I'm not trying to relocate it wholesale to the 17th century, but instead to think about how ideas of Frenchness and Englishness uh, came to be bundled together and the importance of food in those self-identifications. Conflict between England and France, obviously, um, there's a great book by uh, Robert and Isabel Thum, uh, which is called um, That Sweet Enemy. Um, so the ongoing conflict between England and France also worked to the development of culture that determine icons of national sentiment. Uh, I've, I've read elsewhere that um, there's sort of like a pair of, of binary stars uh, trapped in an orbit circling each other and at different moments they eclipse each other. And I think that's probably a, a pretty good uh, metaphor for the relationship between the two. So these icons were influenced by cultural exchange um, and we get the circulation of ideas and the agency of individuals. But we also get the increased circulation of goods and the development of a, of a consumer culture that really starts to take off. We get the rapid expansion of foreign trade and we also get wildly divergent economic policies during the period. In England, we get luxury goods imported by the East India Company while France actually focused on the domestic manufacture of luxury goods an attempt at self-sufficiency with autarky as a goal. The idea being that they wouldn't have to import anything from anywhere, but it was all produced internally within France. So um, part of what I look at um, is to answer this question, how do these different economic policies influence the patterns of consumption and the development of English and French culinary traditions? This, um, this family portrait, a uh, family of three at tea, Nice that it all rhymes from Richard Collins um, in uh, sort of circa 1720. It's at the VA. Um, shows this English family um, and their tea equipage. So, all the little bits and pieces there, um, which obviously contribute to this concept of tea as a, as a luxury item. Um, and you also see from the way that the, um, the, uh, the father is, is dressed, is reasonably exotic. So, it's um, uh, there's a, there's a flavor of, of perhaps the Ottoman Empire um, in his dress that's, that's coming through there. This a relationship between uh, luxury, status, uh, consumption, and exoticism. So we think about the national beverages for uh, England and for, for France. For France, we have champagne. And for England, we have tea. It's what um, uh, Bart would have referred to as a, a boisson totem, so like a, an actual like, totem. Uh, beverage uh, that's constantly being consumed. And champagne is protected under, uh, under international law, trademark law, intellectual property law, um, as being exclusively French. You cannot call something champagne if it's not from the Champagne region of France. And it's definitely a symbol of luxury and sophistication. And mythically, it was, and again, in quotes there, invented by the blind monk, Don Perignon. I'll talk more about that. And tea is the quintessential British beverage. The cup of sweet tea offering respite from the relentless rain, and simultaneously offering both comfort and civility. So these are myths that we associate with, uh, with these identities. Where did they come from and how did they develop? And why did they persist even though we now know that Don Perignon did not invent the bubbles, they were put there by uh, English consumers. And um, why do we forget that London was once the coffee drinking capital of the early modern world? Where is the traction for that? So part of what I'm doing um, in the book is challenging these preconceptions um, because it is, I think, um, I think Bart would have referred to um, uh, these myths as being uh, seduisant. You know, they're, they're actually seductive, they're quite alluring. It's enticing to, to give into the myth. But if we reject them, we get an alternative history 
or the more complex story. So this is the sort of complication of rejecting those myths. So during this period, we get empire building, there's exploration, there's scientific discovery, um, and we get early modern consumers that have this tremendous thirst for novelty, which just cannot be slaked. And they're confronted repeatedly with dazzling arrays of new things to eat and drink and new ways to eat and drink them. But some of them are more successful than others. So we need to ask a couple of questions um, related to this. So for example, does supply in itself create demand? So there is a, a early modern um, political economist, Jean-Baptiste Say, who says that um, if, you, if you have demand, uh, sorry, if you have supply, it creates its own demand, which I think is a bit of a solipsism, but um, it, that's something to, to think about. Um, but if you believe that, then really a question comes about, about contingency. What about contingency? And I need, I need to ask the question, and um, there's a historian of coffee houses, Brian Cowan, that asked this. For example, why aren't we all chewing betel nut? So it was certainly discovered at the time. Why wasn't betel nut you know, popular? There are many reasons for that. It's disgusting. Uh, things are too red. Uh, lots of different reasons, um, uh, sort of practical, functional reasons. Um, but then on top of that, um, also, for example, um, uh, simple things like, um, like cannabis, uh, opium, why do these take off at different times? Why not during this period? So the contingency of, for example, coffee being accepted when it's a drink that's consumed by, you know, a capital O other, um, you know, uh, why would you choose the beverage of an infidel um, as, as, your, as your beverage of the moment? So in my analysis, I look at the role that uh, commerce has played on the transmission of ideas. Uh, I look at the relationship between food and identity to look at both the commercial and cultural exchange that occurs in the trading networks of England and France. So I see that there's a mutual influence that occurs here. Um, and we've got the influence of global trade being part of what um, determines uh, food choices and this enduring cultural identity. And if the economic policies of these nation states uh, were influenced by what their citizens chose to eat and drink, then we need to ask a couple of questions. One is, how did the increase in global trade affect the definition of what it became to be known as French and English cultures? How did the demands of those cultures that could be defined as French or English affect trade? And then lastly, how did the economic issues related to uh, the production, both domestic and colonial, uh, consumption and the distribution of food cultures shape the contours of early modern French and English cultural identity? So in the book, I use a series of case studies uh, to look at this, and they, they're seemingly random. So I focus on these specific ingredients um, and comestibles, there's both food and drink. Um, I look at champagne, I look at spices, I look at coffee, and I look at sugar. And in part, I look at them because each one has myths associated with it related to national identification. And again, this is before the idea of a notion of the nation as a political entity. Um, during the 17th century. But in looking at champagne, we've got an ancient beverage, so wine, um, you know, comes to us from antiquity, um, but long before there were bubbles, champagne was a still wine that was served at the coronations of Henry Cathedral. Um, the idea of adding bubbles is, is a novelty. And it comes about through, um, in part, through experimentation um, and a little bit of science, but not too much. Um, but it's, it's a novelty that's related to an old commodity. Spices, again, were very popular um, going uh, back through time. Um, they're introduced um, in large part after um, uh, exploration and uh, certainly through conquest. And then as global trade heats up, spices become less expensive as we get joint stock trading companies around the world, importing them into Europe and breaking what was once the overland trade monopoly. So when that happens, we get changes in how cuisine is represented, um, both uh, in France uh, and in England. And there are arguments related to uh, uh, luxury consumption that, change, that suggests that that's what prompted a change in cuisine. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Second, uh, coffee um, also, um, it was new in the sense that it wasn't, it was, they knew about it, but it wasn't really widely consumed. Um, so coffee grows um, wild in Ethiopia, and it gets um, brought, to, uh, brought to Europe, um, and it gets brought uh, to other parts of Asia. There's a great myth um, called the Seven Seeds, 
which talks about a Sufi pilgrim who is doing the Hajj. He goes to Mecca, he comes back and he stops in, um, in Yemen and he finds a coffee plant and he takes seven seeds. And seven is a mystic number, uh, mystical number um, for, uh, for the Sufi religion. And he hides them and he gets, I guess he had like a massive beard and then also some sort of sash. And between the beard and the sash, he hides these seven seeds and then brings them back. And he, he takes them to Malabar and um, he plants them there and they grow. And it's these original plants that the Dutch actually took and then replanted in Java. So there's a, a whole origin backstory uh, to coffee, but it doesn't really address, for example, um, why there was a, a, sort of such a quick reception of coffee when it's the drink of, uh, of what they would have referred to as Mahometans. Uh, why, uh, why is it okay to, to do that? Uh, even so, even more so, if we think about our, our previous picture, why was it okay to dress like an infidel? What, what, what changed in terms of the relationship? Because you've got to remember at the time, too, that um, if you were taken um, as a prisoner by, by either side in the battles between, let's say, for example, between the French and the Ottoman Empire, uh, you'd wind up in a galley. Um, um, you'd wind up as a galley slave uh, for either side. Um, and one of the greatest threats was that if you were taken, a uh, prisoner would be a uh, forced conversion for, for either, that you know, suddenly you would, your immortal soul was at risk because you know, you've been taken captive. So how did this happen? And then more so, the London Coffee House has been kind of forgotten as a relic of the past. But the cafe in, um, in France is certainly a, a mainstay of, of French culture. And certainly when people think about uh, cafes, they think of Paris. But it took more than 20 years for the first cafe to turn up in France, and it wasn't even in Paris, it was in Marseille, um, after the, uh, the first coffee house in um, Britain. So you're right across the channel, and that's why the subtitle of the book is Across the Channel. There are times when we get exchange, and there are times when we don't have an exchange. And I want to think about, you know, why does that happen? Why is it sometimes a one-way street? Um, why, why, for example, um, you know, do we get um, Britons suddenly um, uh, having influence over a wine industry when they don't actually grow grapes? Why? Uh, why would uh, a coffee house develop in, uh, in England, uh, but then not be taken up in France for nearly two decades when they're actually drinking coffee? Lastly, a look at sugar, which again was known um, uh, going back into time. Um, uh, so certainly some additional contact with sugar production came through the Crusades, um, but sugar in the colonies um, meant that production and then therefore the expense of sugar dropped markedly uh, in the 17th century. Sugar colonies date from, so for example, Barbados is 1625 and Jamaica is uh, taken um, during the westward expansion uh, in 1654, I think. Um, so um, large uh, sugar producers um, are around and sugar prices do fall and we get different patterns of consumption that emerge in both. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about those here as I work my way through. So there is Dom Perignon, um, that's in Epernay, uh, the Champagne region of France. And you can see in the back, you can see that it's, it's referencing Moet et Chanton, um, one of the, the big um, Champagne houses, and the one that bears uh, his name for one of its top premium Champagnes. Uh, there, the, uh, the concept of méthode anglaise is a play on words because Traditionally, French is made using um, the méthode champenoise or the méthode traditionnelle, um, and hereby saying anglaise, I'm attributing the, um, the influence of the English in making champagne. Um, Come brothers, I'm drinking stars, um, is, is part of the, uh, the great myth that uh, Dom Perignon discovers the effervescence and, uh, and captures it. So I'll talk about that and the paradox of English effervescence more in a second, along with probing the paradox of why necessity was uh, the mother of invention. Uh, for those of you who are not Francophone, Bois la Francoise, it's not an error that's yieldy French, that's why it says Francoise, not Francaise. Um, Bois la Francoise, baptême et verju, um, it refers to baptism and verjus. Verjus, if you know, so for example, if you're cooking a lot, you can go buy Maggie beer, verjus, um, to, it's sort of a, a mild wine based vinegar. Um, but that's the way that the champagne uh, wines were thought of, is that they required both baptism, you had to sprinkle them with water, and they tasted a bit like verjuice. So there was some work that had to be done uh, by Dom Perignon, but it really wasn't 
polluted to bubbles. Um, for the taxes, treaties, embargoes, and tastes, and the mercantilist pressures on the English palate, um, there was a trade war that went on for some time between England and France. And as part of that, the French finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, um, was approached when he slapped a massive export tariff on wines being sold to England. And um, the wine producers were outraged. They said, we're really concerned. This is going to adversely affect us. And he said, no, actually, um, you know, first of all, English consumers can't resist French wines. What are they going to drink? Portuguese wine. And the second thing he said was that um, um, he, he made this important sort of um, observation. The higher prices would actually make the wines more attractive. So this disconnect um, uh, in terms of microeconomics is what's usually referred to as the Veblen effect for Thorsten Veblen. Um, and the idea that, that luxury items um, have their own cachet. And sometimes when something's more expensive, it becomes more desirable because fewer people can afford it. So you don't always have that crossover between um, supply and demand and price where we say, okay, well, we need to make it cheaper. Otherwise, people won't buy it. In this case, it worked the other way around. And the same is true um, with our remark about uh, Portuguese wines. There was a treaty in place uh, with Portugal, the Methuen Treaty. Um, as part of that, Portuguese wines um, were free from duties. So they wanted being considerably cheaper than the low-end French wines. So this created this weird market segmentation at this time in France where um, if you bought cheap wine, you bought Portuguese wine. If you bought expensive wine, you bought French wine. So we sort of established French wines as being part of a, uh, the top end of, of a market and that was underpinned by this, um, this treaty that was in place. Um, for spices, spices really go hand in hand with uh, cookbooks and technique. So here, not to engage in too much ramification, but we do have the printing press as an agent of change. We get um, an increase in printed materials and um, certainly that comes about with cookbooks. So uh, this is the first cookbook to come out um, in France for, I think it was something like 50 years. Um, and it comes out and it's specifically French. It, it, it puts forward a new idea of what it means to be cooking um, uh, as, a, as a French person. And in its um, introduction, it begins with notre France. And it, it makes it clear that this is a national mode of dining. It's quite different. And in it, it rejects spices. So all the medieval spices that were used across Europe as the courtly tradition of consumption were abandoned in this new cookbook. So what was considered to be um, a necessary luxury to show that you had the, the money, the power, the connections to get a hold of these exotic spices, Suddenly, they're all rejected in this new mode of cooking, which aims to be only domestic French herbs. So um, as part of this, the argument is usually that what's happened is that the price of spices has dropped. Because of that, they're no longer a signifier of wealth and influence. And you needed something in that vacuum to replace um, that signifier. And the argument that's usually made is that technique is now the new expensive ingredient. You need to have um, an experienced professional chef that's uh, able to produce things according to these new, more elaborate cooking methods that are gonna be more delicate and more refined. So rather than being based upon uh, sort of opulence of um, conspicuous use of spices and colors that were meant to uh, match up with things like humors um, and uh, the sort of Galenic uh, ideals of, uh, of dining. Uh, now there's going to be this new type of refinement that's going to work for you instead. The thing is that not everyone adopted this. Much, much of Europe did. Much of Europe said, okay, this is the, this is the, new, uh, this is the new mode. And in that sense, um, it becomes, in a sense, its own luxury export. It becomes a cultural export um, where there's this emulation. At the same time that France is um, engaging in this uh, culinary revolution, they're also making an effort to then replace luxury items that are normally imported. So for example, Flemish tapestries are replaced by the Gobelin. So um, especially so like in the, what's now the fourth arrondissement in Paris, in Paris uh, we get the Gobelin's uh, tapestries being produced. Uh, we have Ebenistes for making things that are like lacquerware, which would normally come from China, um, and mirrors, which were originally the sole um, 
province of, uh, let's say, Venetian glassmakers, for example, so in Italy. Um, so if you've ever been to Versailles and you see the Galerie de Glace and all the mirrors there, it's supposed to be a big deal that there are that many mirrors because they're quite expensive to produce. But Colbert actually spirited um, several um, Venetian mirror makers um, out of Italy, um, had to provide, I think, protection for their families and things like that, um, because otherwise there would be some future repercussions because they were giving away trade secrets that I think today would have to be like, you know, like cold fusion or something like that um, as, 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 a, uh, as a comparable. Um, but the idea was that France was going to produce all these luxury items within France. So rather than having to buy things in um, from China, from, uh, uh, from the Flemish, um, from, um, uh, from the Italians, they're all gonna be produced within France. And the same thing happens with cuisine. Rather than actually importing spices, they're going to develop a cuisine that rejects those spices. And this is mirrored in the relationship with um, the company Desand, which is really, is really a very distant um, competitor in terms of overseas trade. So we have the East India Company, uh, then we have the, uh, the VOC, the uh, Thuringia de Ustelusia Company, the Dutch East India Company, which really wins the spice race, um, as it were. Um, and then the company Desand is, is much further along. Uh, so, uh, the French produce a cuisine, which I argue is more as a form of import substitution, where they don't need the spices anymore. We've developed something new, it's exclusive, and we don't need to import that. Um, meantime, we'll export our own luxury cuisine. Uh, coffee, the coffee house um, developing later is part of what the chapter on coffee is about, but also the contingency of, of how it comes to be that what was considered to be uh, sort of the, the realm of something that um, like, like a Turkish apoth apothecary would be subscribing, um, prescribing, excuse me. Um, there was um, uh, travelers who went overseas, would come back with a habit for making coffee and it was served to dinner guests at the end of a meal in France in the 17th century, but it was really not, it hadn't really taken off. Um, and instead there was a myth that um, a visitor, Solomon Aga from the, um, the Ottoman Empire was uh, sent as a, as a diplomatic representative of the Sultan um, because there's a bit of concern over the trade relationship. Um, and when he comes to Paris, supposedly he transmits this, uh, this, this new um, uh, fashion for coffee. And it's his exoticism that really makes it take off. There's only one problem, and that's actually shown in this picture here, which I actually paid for. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's not a very good resolution, but I paid for it to be used in, a, in another publication um, I wrote about um, uh, diplomacy and Louis XIV. Um, but uh, in, the, in the picture, the foreign minister uh, is actually, in reality, he would have been dressed as the Grand Vizier of the Court Sublime. So the French um, foreign minister dressed like a member of the Ottoman Empire. So he would be dressed in, in robes um, uh, almost like, a, um, like an imam, um, except that he had this huge cross hanging, the cross of Saint Esprit uh, on his chest. But aside from that, he's dressed uh, as, as a Muslim um, official and he's uh, speaking to the, the representative and they have a traditional meeting as it would be conducted in the Port Sublime in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and at the end of it, it ends with the there's a, a traditional trio, which is um, uh, there is uh, incense and there is sherbet and there is coffee. So rather than the, um, the diplomat from the Ottoman Empire bringing coffee to Paris, coffee was served to him. The whole idea of the dress up was, was meant to be a game of diplomatic one-upsmanship. This is how you treat our trade representatives in the Port Sublime, that's how we will treat you here. Uh, the difficulty was that they weren't sure if he was an ambassador or just a messenger because he had a letter, but the letter could only be opened by Louis XIV. So no one could actually track and figure out what's the, you know, the right way. Louis the Fourteenth receives him wearing diamonds for the first time in public. He's wearing a diamond, I think, the size of a, of a tennis ball um, in his hat. Um, when he receives this man, and they open the letter and they discover that he's actually just a messenger. He's not supposed to be accorded any of these special things. So, um, in the um, uh, in England, we get the coffee house, which was a bit of a penny university, is what it's called. For a penny's admission, you got a dish of coffee, and um, you could hear a poetry reading. You can have a vibrant political discourse. Uh, you might see a, um, a necropsy, or the, the sort of uh, dissection of a porpoise. Someone might have a, um, 
model of, um, of the solar system. These were all things that you, that you might see. There was also a B side to the menu where there was gambling and prostitution, um, but that was usually upstairs, whereas downstairs was uh, slightly less raucous. Meanwhile, the, Par the Parisian Cafe doesn't show up for another 20 years. And there is this um, battle over the identity of the Parisian Cafe, which goes from being a um, uh, place for sailors to drink things that they used to drink when they were trading in the Levant, uh, to being a, a space of grandeur, which is filled with the very things that I mentioned before, tapestries, uh, chandeliers, uh, special furniture, and mirrors. So it's not until that space is developed that the cafe actually takes off. Once it becomes a place to see and be seen, um, it really embeds itself into Parisian society. But before then, it doesn't really happen. And the last little bit there refers to um, the sort of the movement away from coffee. The movement away from coffee happens as Britain um, in 1717 gets this uh, monopoly relationship with Canton where they can uh, import tea. And at the same time in France, they've actually been uh, making attempts to grow their own coffee. So they're trying to cut out the middleman, um, again, in France, trying to be self-sufficient, um, uh, self uh, this goal of autarky, trying to grow their own coffee rather than having to pay a middleman uh, to import it. So you get different um, ideas about how you're going to make your money. Are you going to make it doing a carrying trade, or is it going to be a high value trade, or will you have colonial territories where you will actually grow things that, um, that you then harvest, which then leads us to sugar. And I, I love this uh, print only because um, it's, uh, uh, not only is it, it tremendous resolution, but it's got a pineapple sitting on the top, uh, which I've written about um, here in discussions of luxury food. And some of you have heard me lecture on pineapple drawing uh, as well, but a symbol of, uh, of luxury there. Uh, and then the, uh, the chinoiserie, uh, all those elements in the background that look like pagodas um, and fountains and things like that. The funny thing is that you wouldn't expect it, but as this is for a confectioner, they actually made those uh, pagodas and pineapples out of sugar. So they would cast them and then use them as table decorations. So famously, uh, there's an anthropologist that works on sugar, not Sidney Mintz, but uh, Woodruff Smith. And he was teaching a course and talking about how um, slavery really takes off um, in sort of the middle of the 18th century and you know, really skyrockets. And um, at the time, the demand for more enslaved Africans was coming from um, the largest global industry, which was sugar. And a student in his class raised her hand and said, what were they doing with all that sugar? And the problem is, if you think about it, you know, coffee, tea, even hot chocolate as a beverage, they don't use that much sugar. I mean, really. So the question is, well, what was happening with the sugar? So here, well, usually sugar is referred to as tea's inseparable companion. Um, I try to unbundle it. There are uh, people that look at it as a, as a bundle, wanting to look at things like uh, the tea equipage. And I said, well, let's separate tea out of the equation and let's see what else is actually happening um, with that sugar. Um, so for example, uh, how is it used in, a, in a, a sort of less complicated modes of cooking? When we're not making table decorations out of it, what else could be done with it? Um, uh, thinking about those different modes and how they're used differently, both in England and in France. And with the, um, uh, with the colonies, there's a different relationship between the sort of metropole and the periphery in terms of uh, how they were charged for their goods, how they imported things, whether or not it was refined onshore or offshore. Um, in France, a lot of sugar was imported and then re-exported to the continent. Uh, Saint-Domingue alone counted for 40% of all the sugar that was consumed in Europe. So that one little island really made a big difference. Um, and the British uh, sugar colonies um, had to pay special prices for all of their goods uh, trapped in a sort of mercantilist loop um, with, uh, with Britain. So uh, usually by the time um, they had paid for those and sugar arrived on shore, the argument was that it was too expensive for anyone except for Britain to eat. So it was all consumed in place. So there's this um, idea in our minds that, um, uh, that sugar is really um, you know, something that was only for the rich in France, um, but was more affordable, but only to Britons and developed British sweet tooth. Um, so there is uh, some truth to that. Uh, but I do a little bit of analysis to look and see what, what it was like um, to use sugar as a barometer of purchasing power um, and uh, the idea of, of prosperity. 
Um, but the Sun King, who's a sweet tooth, Louis XIV, quite famously um, lost uh, almost all of his teeth. And he lost them because he had a nice sweet tooth. So certainly at the top level, um, there was uh, a, a taste for sugar, but it was more often than not a bourgeois good. So to give you an idea of what this looks like sort of up close, um, I'll give a quick run through of some of the bits from uh, the chapter on champagne. So before the bubbles, um, still champagne uh, wines were the wine of choice over Burgundy um, for coronations and cathedral. Um, but yes, they weren't particularly good. As I mentioned before with baptême of Ajou, uh, you had to baptize them because it had to be diluted because they were sometimes so sour that people said that they tasted like, uh, like a dressing for a salad. Um, they were also this weird color, which is, um, uh, in French is referred to as partridge eye, but it would look like maybe like a cheap sweet wine from America, like a pink Zinfandel, um, which is not always the, the color that you want. Uh, and there were bubbles sometimes. Um, so depending on your harvest, you might have some residual sugar. And then in the very cold cave, the chalk lined um, cellars in the Champagne region, uh, the fermentation would stop and then resume usually around Easter time, and you might get a couple bubbles, but nothing, uh, not enough to pop a cork. And uh, Dom Perignon was sent to uh, Abbey in 1668 to improve the wines, and he was tasked with improving the color. So you could get a clear white wine from either white grapes, which is a blanc de blanc, uh, or as Bugs Bunny says, a blankety blank, or dark grapes, a blanc de noir. However, um, well, lower acidity was a goal, just trying to get rid of that salad dressing thing. Um, but he was there to get rid of the bubbles. Bubbles were seen as a winemaking fault, a trompe l'oeil, a trick to distract the consumer from poor quality wine, and they were seen as, as, as a fault. Um, a French 17th century wine broker in Negociant uh, wrote to a local client who asked for sparkling wine. He told him that this was a mistake. The bubbles are only appropriate in beer and hot chocolate, but not in wine. English clients, however, didn't care about tradition and they liked bubbles. Uh, so when wine showed up in England, they came in barrels. And uh, once you open a barrel, the wine goes off pretty quickly. If you just think about, even with a screw cap, even with that stain cap, um, overnight, um, a half empty bottle of wine never happens in my house. They're always empty. But I've, I've heard that sometimes people have you know, half bottles of wine. And then the next day, the wine started to oxidize and it doesn't really taste the same way. You do that en masse, um, wines tend to deteriorate rather quickly. Um, decanting would help, but only if you did it immediately, otherwise the wine would start to turn. And consumers added everything from pigeon droppings to alum. Alum gets used in things like pickling and canning to make things crisp um, in, an, in an effort to try and improve the wine. And then sugar, especially sugar became a little bit less expensive and was more readily available, was added to improve the flavor of the wine. Uh, combined with decanting and corks, wine fermented in the bottle a second time and produced bubbles with a level of reliability. A paper presented to the Royal Society in London by Christopher Merritt, who was the original librarian of the Royal Society in 1662, described this technique, which was adopted in households rich enough to import wine and decant it. Most notably, um, the Duke of Bedford uh, went to his place and yes, there were records that show, excuse me, the purchase of bottles um, and corks um, and wine from Champagne. So the wines of Champagne were ideal for this because they often had some residual sugar and a few bubbles, but again, not enough to pop a cork. So you had to add sugar. And there's a, there's a, a, one of the blue uh, plaques for Christopher Merritt uh, advertising his role. So the English paradox is the way that French wine historians refer to this, um, saying, well, how could it be? How could, some, uh, how could a country that does not grow grapes or even make wine pioneer a winemaking technique that would become so closely identified with France. So traditional fermentation techniques required a very thick, strong bottle um, and corks. Um, just as a note there, the pressure inside a champagne bottle is the same as in a car tire. So they're, they like to explode. Um, you needed corks. Um, English glass was very strong. And this is because there was a proclamation um, by James I in 1615 that prohibited the use of wood as fuel for furnaces. Instead, they used sea coal. Higher temperatures in a cold file furnace made for stronger glass. Sir Kenelm Digby, um, who later wrote a book called The Queen's Closet Opened um, as a sort of cookbook, um, had a patent uh, in, uh, in this period for producing strong glass. Uh, English cider and peri producers, if you're making um, 
you're using pairs, it's Perry. Um, producers, those producers use cork to seal their bottles. So they were, they were keen to use uh, cork, but French winemakers only use wooden stoppers with canvas soaked in grease, uh, which doesn't really work that well. And there was already this English habit of adding sugar to wine. So um, we get um, uh, Falstaff uh, talking to Prince Hal uh, and says, if sugar and sack, which is sherry and sin, then God help the wicked. Samuel Pepys writes about uh, having uh, a hippo, hippocras, uh, hippocra, uh, which is sort of like a, a room temperature mulled wine with spices and sugar added to it, uh, with the added bonus that you could drink that on days when you're supposed to be fasting because it was, in quotes, medicinal. Uh, but the, the English had this habit of adding sugar to wine to begin with, so it wasn't a really big stretch for them to do that. There I've mentioned for that A-frame, um, uh, and you see the bottles in there with the yellow label is quite distinctive. That's for Veuve Clicquot, the widow Clicquot, who supposedly invented this method of inverting the, the bottles in this kind of rack, which is sometimes called a, a pupitre, because it looks like, a, like an old fashioned French school desk. Um, and then you get the yeasts and the leaves to run down to the, the neck. So it's easier to, to disgorge that uh, degorgement, uh, the, uh, that sort of rubbish. Uh, but those were actually used um, well in advance by cider makers um, in, in Britain. Uh, in, you know, before even before Britain and England, um, uh, to get rid of the, the gunk when you're making cider. So the secret ingredient: um, English consumers contributed bubbles, bottles, and corks. French wine producers provided the wine. And even if we have bubbles naturally occurring in French wines, they're pretty they're pretty mild. You're not gonna you're not gonna um, uh, pop a cork. And French wine producers were still quite adamant in denouncing this as a fault. So. If you've got French clients who are sending the wine back because it's fizzy, um, it's not surprising that we get English consumers that are going to lead the charge. Um, if, um, if this go is going against um, everything that you've ever uh, thought about as being a winemaking tradition, it's kind of hard to break that tradition. It's very difficult. So uh, even in France, once uh, it became a sort of a fad in England, it wasn't embraced until uh, early, uh, early modern influencers um, uh, made it more popular. That was the Marquis de saint armand who actually um, um, made a big push uh, in France for the adoption of this, this trend. Um, so I refer to this um, in my writing, uh, this reluctance to change traditional taste as a form of cultural inertia. Um, and the secret ingredient of English consumers really was a willingness to break the rules. Because if you don't have any rules, it's not hard to break them. So in that sense, this isn't really a paradox because there's no precedent that you have to go against. So very easy for them to break the rules. And since they were already adding um, uh, sugar uh, because they like sugar in their wines, they like to take even sweet sherry and add sugar to it. Um, and if you also did it out of necessity because you have wine that's turning, that's going off because it's um, coming in bulk, um, then yes, it's not that surprising. In addition, there was a 25% tax on wine and bottles, which made it prohibitively expensive. So corks and strong bottles uh, were not widely adopted by winemakers in the Champagne region until 1695 and 1735, respectively. Um, without corks, those bubbles, they don't get held in um, by, by canvas and grease. Uh, instead, all you're left with is sort of a flat but slightly sweet wine. And wheat glass could not withstand the pressure of effervescence at first. Um, you get pictures, uh, even into the 19th century, uh, workers in the, uh, the French wine cellars they wear what kind of looks like a primitive um, uh, baseball catcher's mask uh, because to protect them from flying glass. As they, as they would go about having to turn these bottles to get the sediment uh, to move, uh, the bottles would explode. And there was a special uh, fund that was set up like a, like a widow's and orphans fund, uh, but for the, for the, the, the cave workers uh, because they would be disfigured and hardly scarred by a uh, great glass. However, we get to a point by 1736 where the tide is turned, is no longer just a fashion or a fad for young people. And what was a winemaking fault is now transformed. And we get a poem from Voltaire, um, which is called Le Monde, uh, The Worldly Man. And then he rationalizes uh, luxury and luxury consumption. And specifically, he uses sparkling wine as a poetic device that is poured by goddesses. I know that sometimes Chloris and uh, Eglia can be uh, nymphs, but I'm, I'm upgrading to, uh, to goddess here. Uh, Chloras Egla turned their hands to a foaming wine from I, that is another way of uh, referring to the Champagne wine region. From the bottle, it is launched like a flash. Let's fly the cork. It rises. We laugh. It hits the ceiling. The sparkling foam of this wine is the brilliant 
emblem of France. So from what was a winemaking fault, uh, it now turns and becomes a national emblem. All right, so to conclude here, um, hopefully that gives you a good idea of the kind of things that I work on. Um, and uh, just to reiterate the main themes here, um, looking at those links between taste, trade, and patterns of consumption um, that developed in the 17th century, they get woven into the fabric of everyday life in the early 18th century. And by the 19th century, these foodways become cultural tropes that have been toured to this day. Uh, these habits and the consumer expectations that accompany them are now embedded in the 21st century in a global marketplace. And just even, even in the past, let's say like year or so, uh, especially with the pandemic, we've started to really come to think a little bit more about that. Um, and this trade has just come under um, additional scrutiny as global supply chain struggle um, with the exigencies of the pandemic uh, to meet demand and the ecological impact. So um, Nancy was on earlier, she works on things like at one stage on food miles, uh, the idea of food miles, the ecological impact of imported goods has become more of a consideration. Should we be importing things from across the planet? Should we be eating vegetables out of season? Uh, and the luxury of imported goods was once rationalized by 18th century British commentators like Joseph Addison and the Spectator in terms of national benefit. And he said, there are no more useful members in a commonwealth than merchants. They knit mankind together in a mutual intercourse of good offices, distribute the gifts of nature, find works for the poor and wealth to the rich and magnificence to the great. So uh, I suppose just as something to continue to think about, if this was ever true, how do we rationalize our global health? Thank you. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating uh, paper. Um, I'd like to open up to uh, these questions. Um, and perhaps I will leave it, you know, shamelessly abuse my uh, uh, powers as well, a chair and, and leap in there first. Um, I, I, I found it really interesting. I'm more familiar with the, um, uh, with the food consumption in the Habsburg empire and i'm sort of struck by the myths around coffee there being all about allegedly they found sacks of coffee after the siege of vienna yes. and, and so it becomes part of a triumphalist story of defeating the, the same is true of, of, the, of the croissant yeah uh, being a symbol of of you know defeating the turks and yes yes, yes which the, the hungarians claim of course they invented yes. um, <laughs> uh so is there a similar triumphalism in France around these things, or is it just because of the, the, the history of French and Ottoman cooperation? Does is that not appropriate? It, it, it depends. So, I mean, the thing too is that um, uh, there are all these attempts to try and dismantle the sort of French um, culinary, um, you know, sort of hegemonic status. Um, so, for example, there are um, uh, there is the idea that, say, for example, that um, uh, Louis the Trez, that his mother. Um, uh, you know, the Medici, you know, wind up being responsible for the introduction of, um, of good quality cuisine in, in France. But in that sense, it's really, it's less about triumphalism than it is attempt to try and push the French off the, off, off the pedestal. So yeah, there's less of that in terms of trying to uh, point to, um, uh, to those victories as, um, as being moments, rather than is, it, it is really self-proclaimed greatness that comes out um, in 1651. Um, specifically, the, the spices are rejected as being um, the unrefined taste of Arabs um, that need to be rejected by refined French people. Um, and you need to you know, look within to find this. So, but it's interesting because it was definitely, um, there was an economic war that was being waged at the same time as, as, uh, as everything else. So again, that sort of idea of the cities of, of power coming from mercantilism, um, but then it was also expressed in things like pleasure foods. Question? I had a couple more, sorry, banal yeah. questions. That's all right. I mean, <laughs> I found that fascinating and um, it reminded me, because I'm in, in English, uh, so coffee was dominant and then tea was dominant. Why did coffee die out so entirely in England, do you know? Yeah, so um, there are arguments that, um, that the coffee house, the coffee house basically morphs. Um, it goes from being a coffee house, then it becomes sort of a chocolate house, and then it becomes a club. So, for example, you might go from like a place like White's, which was um, originally a coffee house, then becomes a chocolate house. The chocolate house is, is instead of being sort of like the uh, political discourse or even like Lloyd's, Lloyd's was originally uh, a coffee house. Um, uh, the transmogrification that occurs here is from one of, um, of refined discourse to being the province of the rake. The rake winds up being at the, at the chocolate house. And then from there it goes into being the club. 
So it becomes um, sort of more exclusive. And the idea for many, I think, um, historians of this period, they say that really what happens is that the, um, uh, the coffee house had a moment which occurs again following the interregnum and then you know, with the restoration and this idea that we need this, this, this way to sort of exercise the discourse in some place that's not the tavern, even though there was still alcohol being consumed, but just a different space that had a different sort of, um, if you will, vibe to it. Um, and then once that moment had sort of passed, the cachet of the coffee house wore off, the novelty of coffee wore off and was replaced by things like chocolate. And then you know, once that was you know, eternalized, you know, that wore off and then there was tea. But the difference with tea is that you don't really have tea being consumed in the same way. Tea is a domestic beverage. It's in a domestic space because then you have things like that, um, that portrait here. Yeah, family unit. Yep, the family unit, right? Male and female. So while coffee houses weren't exclusively male, they were certainly male dominated. So here now you have both men and women. It's in a domestic space. Um, you certainly don't have to worry that there's a possibility of there being uh, gambling or prostitution or anything like that. It, you know, it's being enjoyed with the entire family there. You've got the, the dog and the kids, right? So it's a different, it's a different way of, of consuming. So it's a level of respectability that was expected from tea drinking. So it's moving away. At the same time that that happened, you've got to remember that the flip side of this is gin. So the flip side of this is gin. So on the one hand, you've got Hogwarts, you know, sort of, uh, you know, picture of, of, of you know, gin-soaked, um, you know, uh, strumpets, you know, asleep in the straw, um, you know, mothers, you know, with, with children passed up next to them because the, the mother is too drunk to, you know, to, to nurse the child. Um, so on the one hand, we've got this sort of gin, um, uh, you know, sort of epidemic gin crisis. On the other hand, we've got uh, the respectability that's offered by tea. So tea really takes over. And the thing is that the East India Company really made a big push to sell people tea. So they kind of gave up on coffee and then they put the big push on tea. And tea became so popular that even when tea was subject to taxes in places, it was smuggled. So it became one of those things where the more people had it, the more they wanted it. Um, and yeah, it became a real. And some of this still has at its basis, does it like beer? The fact that the water is still not safe to drink in England, as it's in London, yes. until yeah. that point. Yeah, so actually, so um, most people don't realize that for um, that for Hogarth, the, the flip side of gin is, is beer. So there's actually, there actually it's supposed to be a diptych, it's supposed to be paid, uh, a pendant pair. Those two images are supposed to be hung side by side. So there's a beer street, and on beer street, everyone's happy. They're drinking this appropriate, because gin actually originally comes from the Netherlands, it's Genever. So the idea is that you're drinking this foreign drink that you shouldn't be drinking, it's you know, it's, it's a national thing. It's yeah, thing. so the national thing as well, even though it's, you know, much being London dry gin originally comes from uh, the Netherlands. Oh, so, but not appropriate for an Englishman. You get too drunk. You should be drinking uh, beer. It's not nice. ale, though, because ale got left behind. Now it's, you know, we got traditional ale enthusiasts and anoraks, you know, yeah. plenty about things not coming from a cask. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, ale was traditional. Ale got replaced by beer. Yeah. And meanwhile, gin was an upstart that was just too damaging. Uh, thank you. That's great. Uh, other questions? Let's see the questions. Points. Could I ask a question? Please. Thanks. Um, thanks. So, so great to hear uh, more detail about your work after knowing about it in general terms. Um, I, I loved what you were saying about um, food innovation and the importance of it in our time as well is something that I think we really need to take on board, especially in terms of um, protein. Um, but my question is about what you were, the commerce aspect of this and, you know, the importance of sugar to the British economy, the importance of spices to the Dutch economy. So what weren't the, the French finding some food stuff that they could be um, gaining profit from in their colonies? Okay. So um, they were most concerned with basically making sure that they had everything that they needed internally and then producing goods that they could then export. And for them, it was more in the, in the form of um, uh, things like tapestries, mirrors, uh, furniture. Those were the things that they exported instead. Um, although uh, quite famously, um, there was a, a real taste in England for uh, French butter and French cheese. And um, 
there once being sort of a trade war over those dairy products um, um, as well. Um, there's also a, a trade war with um, Holland, with the French, and that's actually where we have mimolette. So originally there was a, a cheese that was supposed to be made in Holland and was much valued by the French. Um, Colbert refused to import it, um, and they came up with mimolette. They dyed it orange with a natto to make it look different than the Dutch cheese. Um, but yeah, so they've, it's, it's part of it is the trade war um, focuses on different types of goods. And for France, they chose to make, rather than having uh, spices, which they saw as being part of a carrying trade that really at some stage would run out of steam, uh, they tried to move towards different things like textiles um, and, uh, and, and finished goods uh, rather, than, uh, rather than foodstuffs. Where they do make a push is later after this period where they try to make more of a push uh, beyond sugar into things like coffee. So that's where we get this idea of botanical imperialism, uh, where they start to think about being able to grow these things someplace else. So part of it you get with things like coffee, but then you also get things like later on like vanilla, um, where that happens. You also get it happening even with spices. So quite interestingly, there is a, um, a figure in French history named Pierre Poivre. So literally his name is Peter Pepper, and he is actually uh, given a, a secret mission to go and smuggle uh, pepper plants uh, and then take them to, um, to locations to grow. So they do pursue this in terms of foodstuffs, but not within this period. It tends to be later in the 18th century that the French look to grow in their colonial possessions, not within mainland France per se, but in the colonial possessions. So a, lot, a large part of it is about protection of their own. So for example, with, um, with sugar, um, French sugar producers couldn't, um, they couldn't make molasses um, and then sell it. They couldn't actually um, develop any sort of alcohol from sugar and sell it because it was forbidden. Because they were trying to protect the, um, the, uh, the grape growers in France and protect that. So wine winds up being the one thing that is a, you know, a food stuff effectively, that winds up being the big thing for the French. It's a national symbol, but they need to protect that at all costs. That's why, for example, um, there is only, there is no real French rum per se that's made from molasses. Instead, there's something called rum agricole, which is actually fermented cane juice. So it's a different thing altogether. It tastes quite different. Um, it's a different, it's more like um, uh, the Brazilian spirit cachaça. Um, but yeah, so it's, it was a disadvantage for these sugar producers. So they basically had to smuggle their molasses and any spirits they made to the Americas because they couldn't sell it back to France because the emphasis was on protecting um, within the French borders, protecting the domestic industry. So French wine probably during the period was the thing that they did focus on. And then later they looked to grow other foodstuffs but outside of, uh, outside of France in territorial possessions. Also, I mentioned your, your food miles, if you, if you heard that last part of it. <laughs> Great, are there other questions? Yes, I have a question, uh, yep. right at the 10.59 mark. Um, uh, thank you for that, Chip. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, um, I know you're focusing on France and England, um, but when you were talking um, on the Champagne, I was thinking about um, the Italian sparkling varieties like Prosecco and Lombrusco. Um, was the same kind of dynamic of trade and sugar affecting the, the development of um, wines in the rest of Europe? So it's a little bit different um, in the sense that the Italians don't have the pressure that the English do to um, fix wine that's gone off the trends because they've got their own internal supply. So instead, they're taking the winemaking techniques that are being sort of pioneered, and then they're trying their hand with them. So once they know, oh, okay, if I, have, if I add sugar, it actually produces this effect. So for a long time in France, um, they didn't have the science to really understand what produced the bubbles uh, in a reliable way. So lots of times they thought it actually had something to do with the moon. Um, which actually, if I, if I understand it, I think there's actually, um, I think, I'm not sure if it's uh, the makers of Jacob's Creek or, or Penfolds, there is a wine producer in Australia that's actually producing things in, in, in terms of biorhythms uh, with natural movements. But yeah, for those, um, uh, for those areas, they, part of it, what they did was they adopted those four techniques rather than out of necessity, they purposely adopted them and put them in place. Um, and the other thing too, is that if there was a significant export market, then they would try and cater for that. So, um, so for other things like for, let's say for German wines that are very um, sort of sweet or wines that came out of Spain or Portugal, they made them very sweet for an English market 
So sometimes you had that influence where they would say, we've got buyers, they want something that's especially sweet, so they'll make something that suits that market really for export. And then it winds up being something that's adopted nationally. And for things like Prosecco and Lambrusco, they took the same winemaking techniques that were being popularized first by the, um, the English and then by the French, and then trying their hand with them saying, well, what, what, what suits, um, you know, what, what sort of wines do we make where, you know, adding bubbles would be, you know, would be a good thing. I mean, again, it's the kind of thing that can happen naturally a little bit, but um, so for example, even like um, for uh, Portuguese wine, so for Vinho Verde out of Portugal, when you get it now, if you get the bottle and, you, and one of those and you shake it a little bit, you'll, you'll see bubbles. So some wines it occurs naturally. So then it's a question of then just trying to give it a little bit of a boost. But it is a, it's a quite an elaboration to have to add extra sugar to each bottle and then stopper it up and, you know, with extra yeast and get the bubbles and then get the gunk out. So that way it's not making it all look like cloudy apple juice. So yeah, no, they, they, they saw the techniques that were being used and then they said, yes, we think that we can do the same thing. Which one of our wines would actually be best uh, to do that with? Uh, it's, it's certainly interesting that um, in Italy that you get it with red wine where, you know, it's, it's not something that gets done in, in France at all. So uh, it's, a, it's a very different thing to have a sparkling red uh, uh, coming from Italy because the French, again, even when they were breaking the rules and, and did it with white wine, uh, even now, I think the, the idea of a sparkling red is, a, is anathema to the French. Okay, so please join me in thanking uh, Chip for an absolutely fascinating uh, 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 paper. Thank you guys for organizing. Uh, before you go, I just want to, to mention that our next seminar will be next week um, on Friday, the 16th of September, and that one will be online only. Uh, our speaker, Edith uh, Golbashi from Leipzig University, will be staying up very late or getting up very early in the morning there um, to be presenting on the origins and dynamics of pogrom violence against Ottoman Armenians in the 1890s. Until then, thank you all. Stay dry and have a great weekend. Thank you.